Welcome back, everyone. For those of you just joining us, this is part two of a two-part series I'm doing on Monster Hunter Combat Design. So if you haven't watched part one, kindly uh, go back and watch it. I'll stick it in one of those weird video card things up at the top right or in the description. So just, just go skedaddle and watch that. Those of you that have already seen it, stick around. Here we go. Right, I'm sure this is what you've all been dying to hear about. Monster design. Now, obviously, I'm not talking about the visual design of them. That's a whole other video. No, we're going to be doing a general analysis of how these fights are structured and what impact monster classification and subclassification has on the fights as they're designed. We won't be digging into the individual monsters outside of special cases, as just about every large monster could be a video in their own right, and indeed they probably will be. Someday. That being said, now that you're sufficiently confused by my laying out of my self-imposed rules of this video, let's get started. First up, monsters can be broken down into three categories that are separate from their classifications. Small monsters, large monsters, and elder dragons. Small monsters aren't really much to talk about. A cliff note, really. Most of them are easy to ignore. At best, they're used to obtain material for equipment and items, and at worst, they're annoying idiots that will throw themselves at you bodily into the middle of pitched combat just to piss you off. This will usually result in a major interruption to player combos, creating openings for larger monsters to attack you, albeit by accident, or in the worst case scenario, they can set you up for death. Bullfango and Ramphoros are amongst the most infamous, as they'll often blindside you and send you flying. A new favorite to hate on is the Kanju, which will knock you on your butt and deflect your attacks by attaching themselves to the monsters. And my personal least favorite, which are the Apsaros, which will go out of their way to block your camera during a fight and attack you while you're trying to regain your bearings. While there are a plethora of other smaller monsters that may attack you with status ailments, most of these will die via collateral damage during the main hunts anyway, so they're not really worth mentioning. Suffice it to say, these small monsters that I actually listed by name could be considered wild cards, which exist solely to screw you up when you're having a good time. Now, large monsters are the bread and butter of Monster Hunter Combat. They're what you, the player, will be fighting most of the game. We're going to be examining them by their generation they're introduced, including later permutations of their skeleton introduced in later generations, for example the difference between a Rathalos and a Tigrex body type. We'll also be excluding subspecies and other variants which we'll discuss later in the video. So let's get started with Gen 1. QB? A lot could be said about Generation 1's variety, but being the first game in a brand new genre is really tough, especially when you're a game development team that's yet to prove itself, cutting your teeth on not only a brand new game but also working within a relatively small budget. Under these circumstances, any team is bound to have lots of limitations. The Monster Hunter team didn't let that hold them back though, as the limitations bred a certain amount of creativity, especially when talking about the monsters, the main focal point of the series. The first release of Monster Hunter on the PlayStation 2 only had 17 different large monsters, believe it or not, and all of the monsters aside from the three bosses fell into one of three categories. Each category ended up using the same modeling rig, just with different animations and poses. That said, the game still uses its limitations to its advantage, by having each monster sort of teach you something about how the game is played. For instance, the first few monsters you'll be fighting are the small raptor-type bird wyverns. At first, they teach you about positioning, dodging, and pressing the attack, but later compound it by adding a status ailment like paralysis or poison, while also being a relatively weak monster, allowing you to explore their individual habitats. The larger bird wyvern type monster, the Yon Kutku, is the first monster that poses a real challenge. It's often considered the wall of first generation, the monster that has you put everything you've learned so far to the test in order to come out on top. The flagship monster, Rathalos, as well as his relative Rathian, and many other monsters in that game, are classified as flying wyverns, large bipedal monsters with wings that resemble what we normally think of as dragons here in the west. Some monsters in this category will teach you about weapon sharpness and durability, some will teach you about being prepared for a hunt by bringing items that counter its abilities, and others still will test you as a player. How long can you last against a monster that's absolutely unrelenting in its assault? The other infamous monster type from the first generation is the Piscean Wyvern. Every single one of these little troublemakers are just a pain in the neck to fight, and this was the game that introduced the hip-check machine himself, Plezioth. 
The fish-like Piscine Wyverns tend to teach you about the environment itself. Gathering the correct items and learning the monster's habitat is entirely necessary if you're going to land even your first blow on these monsters. First generation might have had its limitations, but the team behind the game really knocked it out of the park, making each one of these encounters truly unique. It's a formula that worked very well, and each one of the sequels did nothing but improve and evolve the series. After the PlayStation 2 original, there was a standalone expansion released in Japan that added lots more content to the game, like subspecies monsters with different and harder movesets and a port of the game to the PlayStation Portable, but it was Monster Hunter 2 that took the series to the next level. Generation 2 is quite a doozy. For many players, it's their favorite iteration on Monster Hunter in the series to this day, most notably titles like Monster Hunter Freedom Unite, and it's understandable why. Generation 2 brought a lot of welcome changes to the series, some of which we mentioned in the last part, but for this we'll be talking about the new additions to the monster design. While the Flying Wyverns and Piscine Wyverns were neat in Generation 1, Generation 2 introduced far more body types for monsters, from Carapacians, Fang Beasts, and a new permutation of Flying Wyverns. All of these brought some much needed variety to the fights that I personally found to be a bit lacking with the classification of the previous generation. That said, let's start with the Carapacians, which contains exactly three monsters, the Daimyo Hermitar and the Shogun Senator, which are similar in that they're giant hermit crabs sporting the head of other monsters as their shell. What makes Carapacians unique, even among most monster types, is their robotic movement patterns. Being crabs, obviously their main mode of movement is to scurry side to side in pursuit of hunters. These patterns make them initially difficult to read, and while these two do sport unique characteristics between them, it's this aspect which sets this monster classification apart. Relearning how to read monsters with each new encounter is a big part of monster hunting, and it's all the more apparent with body types as wildly different as these. Now, there's technically one last Carpatian, but it's one I'm not familiar with in the slightest, the Shin Gaorin. I was debating whether or not to just hold pseudo-elder dragons till the elder dragon section of the video, but the inclusion of unique pseudo-elder dragons is something found only in the second generation, so to hell with it, we're talking about them now. Oh man, you're really gonna make me talk about Shin Gao Ren? Jeez, easily one of my least favorite monsters ever. He's a giant creepy crab with creepy little crab eyes on antenna, and he's about eight stories tall when he stands up. He showed up at the end of Monster Hunter Dose's campaign, and thankfully he never made it outside the realm of second generation. His fight was boring, to say the very least, and throw in the fact that the encounter was required to proceed in the game, just a literal nightmare. In fact, let's move on from Carapacians to something a little bit more entertaining, the fanged beasts of second generation, the Primatus monster. Monsters. As the name suggests, this group isn't monkeying around, or they are actually, because they're monkeys. I'm sorry, I'll stop. Anyway, this group is pretty varied, even though they all share the same basic model. Kongalala is a basic monster that teaches about the group's attacks and reach, while the Blungonga adds more wrinkles to the mix by being aggressive, hitting really hard, and being a real pain in the neck. And despite him being a real pain, He's a cakewalk compared to the real terror that is Red Jang, a supersized monkey with a bad temper and the powers of your average Dragon Ball Z character. There's a reason he became a meme, you know. Even the thought of fighting another furious Red Jang in the Freedom Unite volcano map is giving me the shivers. Let's move on to something a little less hairy. Next is the new permutation of the Flying Wyvern, the Quadrupeds. This classification contains the likes of Tigrex, Nargakuga, Akantor, and Ukanlos. The Cantor and Ukanlos technically fall into the pseudo-elder dragon category, much like Shin Gao Rin, but their behaviors are more or less the same as other quadrupeds. Unlike Shin, who was, as far as I'm aware, different from the other two Carapacians. What separates the quadrupeds from the flying wyverns of the previous generation is their focus on ground-based combat and high mobility, which pairs nicely with their wider frame. Combat encounters with these monsters usually focus on pushing you into draining your stamina, while the likes of Diablos previously would push the player into evading its high-speed charges. Tigrex and the like to aim for a more consistent charge to keep you on your toes for a longer period of time. They push your ability to manage your stamina efficiently in scenarios where normal evasive measures wouldn't be as effective. While they each have their quirks, like diving into the ground and leaping off screen, they're all consistent in presenting some of the most fun and chaotic fights among the large monsters. The third generation took huge strides in monster design. 
Monster Hunter Tri and 3 Ultimate introduced both the Leviathan and Brute Wyvern classifications. The Brute Wyverns in particular are probably among the most diverse in the series, on a monster-by-monster -monster basis, with next to no repeats among them, in strong contrast to the similar design trend seen in Generation 1. Additionally, Monster Hunter Portable 3rd introduced the one and only Fanged Wyvern at time of writing, Zenogre. In my opinion, while the general gameplay of the third generation is a tad lackluster as I mentioned in part 1, I strongly believe that the third generation has the strongest monster design of any generation of the series. But before we dive into that... Bears! I love bears, and third generation has bears, specifically the Fang Beast class, Pelagis. One of my favorite monsters ever falls into this class, the Arzuros. He's a big blue dopey bear that loves honey. He's not a very strong monster, but there's something to be said for his dopey demeanor and his big paws. I'm sorry, that was a really bad pun. Anyway, over in the Glacier map, we've got Lagambi, the bear bunny that loves sliding around on his tummy. Honestly, they really nailed it with the aesthetics of this monster. He's got long ears, which means he's sensitive to loud noises like sonic bombs. He's got a tough tummy that he slides around on, which means that frontal attacks are ineffective if he's standing up. And towards the end of the fight, his exhaustion really shows how tough it is to carry around a back end of that size. But just like the story of Goldilocks, most great things come in sets of threes, and these bears are no exception. The third one is a little different than the rest. He's Volvodon, resident of the Volcano Zone. Like Lagambi before him, Volvodon is a bear mixed with another monster, this time something akin to an armadillo or an anteater with a crazy long tongue. Volvodon uses his tongue to trip you, his venom spit can paralyze you, and he can jump in the air and slam his heft into the ground, causing an earthquake and tons of damage. And I feel like I should make sure to mention his, uh, scent spray. Gross. Anyway, third gen's monsters just have a ton of personality, and I'll throw it back to Link to tell you more about him. With swimming as the main new mechanic for Monster Hunter Tri and 3 Ultimate, it goes without saying that monsters had to be specifically designed to be fought underwater. Yes, the Leviathan. This classification is well known for their heavy focus on swimming. They'll swim through just about anything. You got Leviathans that can swim through water, lava, ice, and sand. While the design focus of the quadrupedal of the flying wyvern supported a distinct wide frame, the Leviathans are commonly designed to have long and slender bodies, with the exception of Nibble, Snarf, and Gobble. Now, despite the diversity of stuff they can swim through, the fights themselves are actually pretty similar to their general design. If I had to compare them to anything, I'd say they have a lot in common with alligators and crocodiles. Many of their attacks focus on attacking in a straight line to complement their longer body, and should the player get to their side, they'll go into a death roll to the side they feel most threatened on. While many of them have a vast array of special attributes like electricity, fire, ice, or water, their physical attacks strive to drive up your spatial awareness during combat. Due to their massive size amongst large monsters, their attacks may become difficult to evade at times as a result. They teach you to learn the minimum safe distance to attack if you want to dish out as much pain as possible while avoiding their massive hitboxes. A good parallel to this would be zoning and fighting games, which... <laughs> Well, I, I find myself comparing Monster Hunter to fighting games a lot, so uh, take that as you will. Now, Brute Wyverns are my bread and butter, the creme de la creme, my all-time favorite monster classification in the series. As previously mentioned, it sports easily the most variety of any large monster classification. The fast-charging bear-off, the explosive boxing Ciprocidios, the oh-so-savage devil's oh, the tanky helicopter, Duramboros, I hate him, and the Wheelin' and Dealin' Uragan. Honestly, the sheer diversity of fighting styles, movement patterns, and general behavior among the Brute Wyverns makes it difficult to find a common trait among them to point out as their focus. So, QB, help, I need a cop out. Oh, I can definitely help you out here. Brute Wyverns really are some of the most unique additions to the series, and the Brute name really does suit them. If you're looking for a common trait that all of them share, it's literally that. They're all brutal. They're less like dragons and more like construction equipment. Baroth's a bulldozer. Duramboros is like a wrecking ball. Uragon seems like something you'd use to flatten out pavement. Brachidios reminds me of the dynamite that you used to blow up a building, and Devil Joe's tendency to eat anything he sees was definitely meant to be a garbage compactor. 
They're brutes through and through, and their attacks definitely live up to the name, but we've still got one more type of monster to cover in 3rd gen, and he's easily my favorite monster in the game, hands down. The sole fanged wyvern in this generation, the Xenogre. Fanged wyverns as a class are all fast, energetic fights, totally different than anything else in the previous generations. They're built to test your limits as a hunter, and Xenogre brings it to the extreme. His first appearance in Portable 3rd was one of the most dramatic and intense moments in the entire series. From the opening cutscene to the moment where he invades your simple bull drum quest, it's like he's a looming threat throughout the entire game. And then your final showdown with him is suitably epic. His theme song blasts electric guitar, and when he howls, it echoes across the entire map. Fighting him, for a lack of a better word, is epic. And I'm glad that I got that moment to gush about him as much as I did here, and we saved the best for last when it comes to third generation monsters. With that out of the way, I feel like we should move on to what is arguably the best generation of Monster Hunter games so far, Monster Hunter 4 and 4 Ultimate on the 3DS. Link? The fourth generation brought about four new classifications of monster, which it surprisingly doesn't do much with. I imagine a lot of this is related to the development going into adjusting older monsters for the new three-dimensional combat, but it's nonetheless slightly disappointing. But before we dive into that, let's talk about the Ketchawacha, the latest addition to the Thanged Wyvern Primatus classification. There's nothing terribly remarkable about it. It's a very well-designed monster, and its only real claim to fame in design is that its existence is a means by which to teach the player the new 3D navigation systems. With that out of the way, let's move on to the new classification, starting with... Amphibians! Yes, Amphibians! We've got two frog boys to talk about today. Tusk Boy, Tetsukabra, and the land shark frog thing, Xamtrios. These two share very similar skeletons for their design, but the ways in which they utilize them are vastly different. While Tetsu will bash you with boulders and leap at you aggressively, Xamtrios will blast you with eyes and eat you. The common element in their focus is on circumventing defenses. Defensive monsters aren't exactly common in the series. Tanky monsters, certainly, but the series at this point hasn't really seen a defensive-focused monster since the second generation's Carapacians. But these amphibians differentiate themselves with their defenses tying directly into their offense. They're the embodiment of the phrase, the best defense is good offense. Tetsukabra shields its faithless boulders it lifts from the ground, utilizing them for powerful explosive attacks when it crushes the boulder in its jaw. Xamtrios grows ice armor when it becomes enraged, causing many weapons to bounce off on impact and increasing its physical damage output. It incentivizes and teaches the player to find a way to circumvent these defenses or break through them, preparing them for later encounters where monsters will have stronger plating as the norm. Now, I'm actually cheating a bit with this one, since snake wyverns were technically introduced in the second generation of Monster Hunter, but they were small monsters, so it technically doesn't count. Right? The fourth generation introduced the first large snake wyvern, Najarala. It's a about what you'd expect from a snake. It's long, fast, and slithers about a bit. If I had to describe the fighting style, I'd say it's the exact opposite of the Leviathans. While they were designed to teach you how to zone monsters by understanding your spacing, the Najarala tries to zone you. Much of its moveset is focused on encircling the hunters and reducing their range of movement, so a good part of the challenge comes from learning how to escape its attempts to zone you. And while I wanted to save talk about this for later, its subspecies, the title Najarala, takes it a step further by giving it the ability to redirect its newfound projectile attacks with its shedded scales, drawing your attention not only to escaping its attempts to surround you, but also forcing you to become more aware of your surroundings as the arena slowly feels with these refracting scales. In another instance of adding monsters to a roster that previously consisted only of small monsters, we've got Nyepterons, or Insectoids, namely Celtus and Celtus Queen, which, despite the name, are completely different monsters. Celtus is basically just another introduction to 3D movement-based combat. I know I mentioned Catch the Watcher earlier, but the regular Celtus is introduced first, so it's understandably a lot easier to kill. There's honestly not much to its moveset. It's about as much of a pushover as most of the bird wyverns from Generation 1 with its only remarkable feature being flight as its primary form of mobility. A trait that isn't really common among most monsters. A Celtus Queen is where things get interesting. Far larger than her male counterpart, the Celtus Queen is basically a tank on legs. On the most basic level, its moveset has a lot in common with Tigrex, focusing primarily on charging with the additional projectile attacks. 
It's pretty bog standard and straightforward monster design, but it does have one thing that sets it apart from every other monster, and that's its symbiotic relationship with the small male Celtus. When united, Celtus queens get a huge boost to damage and speed, along with flight. It shifts priority from itself during the battle by encouraging hunters to eliminate the Celtus riding on top. It elevates this monster design to new heights, and I can only hope that we see more kinds of symbiotic monster designs in the future. I don't know why QB wanted to single out the Faded Four for Monster Hunter Generations, but apparently we're doing it, so take it away, QB. Well, I felt like since Monster Hunter Generations really didn't fall into 4th or 5th gen, it still deserves its time in the sun, if anything, to point out the awesome designs and mechanics of the monsters unique to this game. And, now that it's my turn to talk, I wanted to sneak in some details about a monster that I'm really fond of, Malfestio. He's a giant bird, totally out of character with the rest of the series, with colorful plumage, piercing eyes, and multiple status effects. He's not a terribly difficult fight, but his design deserves at least a little attention, I felt. If you haven't seen this monster before, he's worth seeing at least once. Plus, his armor looks phenomenal. With that said, I'll get into the part that I was supposed to talk about, the Faded Four. Each of the previous games in the series had a flagship monster, the monster that's the reason the story happens, to put it simply. But Generations really leaned into the theme of four generations coming together at a crossover and ended up having four flagship monsters. Glavinus, the brute wyvern with a sword for the tail. Gameth, the giant elephant mammoth covered in snow. Astalos, the flying wyvern that's sort of a cross between a ferocious lightning bug and a rathalos. And my personal favorite monster of all time, Mizutsune, the bubble dragon. To prevent this video from going on too long, I'll keep the description short, but each one of these monsters adds new mechanics to the game, taking concepts from the monster types that they're based on and adding a new twist, making each one of them truly unique. Because of their unique designs, and the fact that they were built from the ground up to emulate the style of older games but improve on it, they have some of the most natural and unique animations in the entire series. I really hope that these monsters don't get stuck in a half-generation spin-off game and manage to make another appearance in the future of the series. Anyway, I'm sorry about the diversion, I'll throw it back to Link to talk about about the biggest beasties in the series. Now, if you hadn't caught on, the trend of the design from the third and fourth generation monsters is to better prepare the player for the challenges that'll come later in the game. Many of the traits that the monsters focus on are further exaggerated by Elder Dragons, and that brings us to... Question mark, question mark, question mark. I don't know why this classification exists. It's basically just a baby Elder Dragon, so we're skipping on to Elder Dragons. Was that a good segue? Hell if I care. Let's get to it. Elder Dragons can be broken down into at least three major categories. You got the small boys, the big boys, and the dangerous first class monsters. In the broad strokes, most of the small boy Elder Dragons are designed to take a single concept and push it to the limit. Be it invisibility, wind, explosives and fire, lightning, you name it, it probably exists. They're designed to be the final test of your skill as a hunter often serving as the final quest of each of their respective games. As Elder Dragons are basically just a grab bag of different monster concepts, it's usually difficult to go into a single defining trait for a category. The big boy Elder Dragons are spectacle battles. They're more often than not typically heavily scripted battles that act more as a DPS race more than anything. That's damage per second for those of you not in the know. They usually emphasize utilizing artillery for maximizing damage from a distance, and in some instances running across the back of these goliaths to exploit weak points in their armor, all close and personal-like. They're certainly still fun and challenging, but I don't think they're quite as involved as some of the smaller monsters and elder dragons. Lastly is, as the lore dubs it, the dangerous first-class monster category of Elder Dragon, which consists of exactly five monsters, Fatalis, Crimson Fatalis, White Fatalis, Elatrion, and Dire Morales. These are the monsters among monsters, the Elder Dragons among Elder Dragons, destruction incarnate. They sport easily the hardest battles in the entire series, and they're a surprise best left unspoiled. For now. Unfortunately, they haven't been updated since the third generation with the last of them being the aforementioned Elatrion and Dire Morales, so hopefully we'll see some new additions to this roster with World. 
we've totally missed something really important here. While there are lots of unique monsters in each game, and they get harder as you progress, we're totally forgetting to mention the things that bring the most variety to each generation's roster. And I'm talking about subspecies, like Pink Rathian, Stygian Zenogre, and Rustor Ambaros, which add attacks to the monster's movesets, rare species like Silver Rathalos or Lucent Narcacuga, which are much more difficult fights due to change mechanics, variant monsters like Furious Rajang, which keep the same movesets but change one small aspect of the fight, like keeping the monster permanently enraged, and deviants like Red Helm Arzuros and Deadeye Yan Garuga, monsters that have survived multiple hunts and have the scars to show it, along with hardened strategies and the abilities to take out any hunter silly enough to try to finally take them down. Each one of these special monster types adds a new wrinkle to the existing monster's formulas, but it also adds more content at a discount. By being able to reuse the basic elements of each monster to create a new encounter, the Monster Hunter team can put more and more content into the game to make the experience last even longer. Okay, this video is getting really long, so final topic, because I'm not turning this into a three-parter. The mechanics of Monster Hunter Lightning Round. Blights. These are status of afflictions you receive from monsters. I've touched on them briefly earlier, but these can range from poison and burns, which can slowly drain your health to varying degrees, to paralysis and sleep, which are pretty self-explanatory. Among the most interesting of the statuses is Dragon Blight, which robs your weapons of their elemental damage till the status is gone, and Blast Blight, which explodes once it's either hit by an attack or left unchecked. Monsters can be afflicted with status as well. Poison functions largely the same for them as it does to you, but susceptibility depends on the monster, just as monsters can be paralyzed and put to sleep. And remember this, this is important. A sleeping monster receives double damage from the first hit it takes upon being woken up, so use this knowledge wisely. Additionally, monsters have stamina as well. This wasn't introduced until the third generation, but over time monsters will become exhausted, their movements will become more clumsy and sluggish, and they may flee to find food if the openings aren't taken advantage of quickly. When a monster is exhausted, they also become more susceptible to long-term effects from statuses and traps. And finally, Rage. After receiving a certain amount of damage or a certain criteria are met over the course of a fight, like with Zenogre, a monster will enter an enraged state where they will become more aggressive, get new moves, and deal more damage. But that's not all. If an exhausted monster becomes enraged, it will temporarily override its exhaustion, so its exploits from before will be less effective. I have little doubt that there will be much more to talk about in regards to the changes once World releases, so I'm planning to give World its own video in a few weeks, or whenever I've played enough to formulate a solid enough opinion to offer a proper critique. Anyway, thanks for sticking around if you watched through the entire thing. If you liked this video, be sure to like and subscribe, and hey, if you have any interest in watching regular streams of Monster Hunter, definitely go check out QB over on Question Block Gaming's channel. It'll be fun! And with that said, I hope you all have a fantastic night and that this video lit a fire under you. God, I'm tired.